Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth, and as you can see by the graphics, today I'm going to be taking a look at Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition Rule Supplement, The Complete Book of Villains. Uh, so this book I really found uh, to be very interesting and uh, really glad that I had purchased it uh, off of eBay. Um, got it for fairly cheap. I mean, it was only about $30. And what really impresses me with this is that um, you can use this with any edition of Dungeons & Dragons or any other tabletop role-playing game, regardless of uh, genre or game system or whatnot. I mean, it really is a, uh, a rule supplement that uh, you can use throughout all of your, uh, all of your tabletop role-playing games uh, because it is just a, a system for uh, for designing not just NPCs at the individual level, but uh, more so at the uh, at the level of truly understanding their motivations, their um, you know their history, their uh, alliances, their rivalries, and and how all of that comes together to develop a. Uh, an NPC, whether it be a patron or an adversary, uh, that is so fleshed out that the player characters are going to have a long-term uh, connection to these NPCs. So these are not just NPCs and NPC organizations that are going to be a one and done. Uh, it's really designed to help the game master create a, um, a component of a long lasting campaign uh, that uh, is a very, very important component to uh, any long lasting campaign. And that is that you wanna make the world seem alive. You want the player characters to feel that they're a part of that world. And, um, and it is through NPC uh, connections and and uh, it's through the interactions with NPCs, uh, especially on a broader scale, that is um, that is really going to breathe that life into a campaign. So, without further ado, let me jump right into it. Uh, so that I'm not making this video way way too long. Uh, so that was a long introduction. So let's get right into it. So here we have uh, the complete uh, book of villains by Kirk Batulu, uh, Batula. Sorry. Um, now I looked into um, I looked into uh, Mr. Batula's um, history of making game content, and I just want to make sure that I uh, I do capture this. So. Um, the complete book was actually not his first thing. Uh, so his first thing, as we can see by this timeline here, was a Dark Sun Adventure uh, E1, Dark Sun E1 Dragon's Crown, where he was credited as a secondary author. Uh, so Richard Baker, Keith Batula, uh, Alex Bond, Jeff Pass, and uh, Lisa Smedman. All right, and then we go back and I'm, I'm ex, you know, accepting RPG Nets categories here. Um, uh, he then did the, uh, the Ivory Triangle, all right, which is another Dark Sun adventure. And here he is the primary author. And then he did the complete book of villains where he is the primary author um, um, and only author actually. Then we get to, after that, he did the uh, Deskandar Island, uh, Island of War. Uh, so this is a uh, fantasy pulp. So this is a, a book, from what I understand, and uh, or a novel, and then the secondary of that. So 
During his uh, four-year career, it, it appears, a uh, four- to five-year career with uh, TRS, um, not TRS, uh, TSR, uh, he, you know, he did quite a few things there during the course of those uh, four to five years. So let's take a look at this here. And I will zoom in on this so that we can see. So we have an introduction and we have Bakshra's uh, tale, an overview on what is a villain. All right, so uh, that's just an introduction and I, I kind of give you an introduction to this anyway. Uh, chapter one, defining your villain. So what is your villain's occupation, uh, objective, motive, personality, attitudes and behavior, tastes and preferences, surroundings, history, network, appearance, abilities and alignment, increasing the intensity, reviewing the process, fleshing out your villain, interviewing your villain, and then getting ideas. All right, so just in this very uh, beginning process, and again, you can use this for patrons as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be um, focused solely on your um, your characters or your PCs, um, nemesis or, or, um, or uh, you know, villains that they have to uh, confront and deal with. So I'm going to go to that chapter one and start taking a look at, you know, each of these things. Um, and uh, we have great art on the inside, all right? So you do have illustrations by uh, Terry Dykstra, uh, Larry Elmore, Graham Nolan, um, cover art so, or color art pieces by Jeff Easley, uh, Bruce Eagle, and Keith Parkinson. So you have phenomenal TSR era um, art artists uh, at work here. So, so here we have what is a villain, unlike the friendly innkeepers and the livery men who may, uh, who may people your, cam uh, your campaign, villains motivate the player's characters to action. <laughs> and again, I am going to make the claim that you can do this same very process with your um, with the patrons of the uh, player characters, especially at lower levels. Um, you know, at higher levels, obviously, uh, the player characters are going to take on this role themselves as being the big movers and shakers and uh, the heads of guilds or. Um, you know, or wizard towers or, or whatnot, churches and such. So early on, you can use this for either villains or uh, for patrons. Villains are opposing forces. Villains are powerful adversaries that the player characters should have a recurring uh, interaction with over, you know, obviously over time. Uh, villains are unsympathetic. Um, villains have bad motives. Villain, uh, villain engage emotions. Uh, by giving your players a villain that they love to hate, you will find they become, uh, they come back to play again and again. Any game is more exciting if your players care about the outcome of events. To this end, villains, enemies, and even allies should be characters who engage your players' emotions, all right? Um, yes, and, and the same thing holds true with their, you know, even with their henchmen, all right? Uh, player characters, you want to create an emotional bond with their henchmen that way, uh, and flesh out their henchmen like this too, right? Uh, so give the henchmen an occupation, an objective, a motivation, you know, a personality, attitudes and behaviors tastes and preferences, surroundings, history. Uh, who do the henchmen know? That's a network that the player characters um, will, will want to potentially engage with. You know, what do they look like and what are their abilities and alignment as well? So anytime you're creating an NPC that is, um, that is meant to be a reoccurring character in the PC's uh, experience. You should be fleshing them out to this level. 
their occupation, their objective. Clearly, you want to know the objective of, um, you know, of these uh, villains, their motive, you know, so what drives them? What are their motivations, their achievement? I really like this one because there tends to be a, um, or there is a tendency, I should say, there is a tendency that when you introduce a, um, you know, a piece, an NPC to the player characters, it's like their, their life exists starting from that moment going forward um, with very little, um, with very little history or, or, you know, backing them up and uh, without achievements, in, you know, oftentimes. A person with a need for achievements sent, sets out to accomplish difficult tasks. He may maintain high standards and work towards distant goals. An achievement-driven person also likes competition and is willing to put forth more effort to attain excellence. A villain with an excessive need for achievement may lie, cheat, steal, or kill Villains may also thrive on the challenge of crushing the heroes. Um, so introducing an NPC to the PCs that is a, an adversary um, that has a long history of achievement prior to that is going to do two things in my opinion. Uh, first thing it's going to do is it's going to make the player characters uh, realize that uh, this is just no, um, you know, this is just no regular mob that they can kill for XP and some and some loot. That this is going to be a truly challenging adversary, um, and by giving that adversary a history of achievements, they can also uh, the PCs can also investigate uh, what took place in those prior acts. And, uh, and pick up clues as to what is the best way to meet this challenge in the future. Affiliation. A person who has the need for affiliation enjoys being with friends and people in general. He accepts people readily. He also makes efforts to win friendship and maintain association with people. A villain with a need for affiliation may join a gang of thugs or resort to acts of cruelty to gain their approval. All right, so again, um, putting them into as part of an organization will up the amount of challenge uh, in being an adversary towards this NPC. Aggression, so how aggressive are they? Autonomy, all right? A villain with the need for autonomy may drift from town to town conning women into marrying him and eventually running off with their money. All right. Um, autonomy could also be an element where you create a rift between the villain that the PCs know and uh, the villain's own um, affiliation. All right. So there, there might be a weakness in there should the PCs discover that uh, this uh, this villain that they're challenged with, uh, you know, has a real sense of autonomy, is trying to act outside of uh, his or her own uh, organization or own affiliation. Exhibition. Um, the villain with a need for exhibition may uh, perform savage acts to gain attention and notoriety. All right, uh, safety, a villain with an overwhelming need for safety would take the only lifeboat on a sinking ship. Um, you know, basically, um, really a coward, you know, in disguise. Um, nurturing, order, power, I'm not going to go through all of these, but each of these are kind of the motivations and, and um, you know, elements that you can factor in to uh, how the NPC is going to function uh, in their relationships with the PCs. Personality is uh, yet another element, uh, very similar to that. Attitudes and behaviors, you know, so there is some overlap here with some, um, you know, with continuously fleshing out 
uh, the motivations and, and the character traits, let's say, and now attitudes and behaviors. So there is going to be some crossover between these. You, you may not need to do all of these in order to fully develop a uh, character like their tastes and preferences and everything is attitudes and behaviors they're they're kind of crossing over the same things um their surroundings so yeah what is their current locale and and what is going on in that current locale their history i already spoke about their history uh and that goes to their past acts as well and their achievements their network is their affiliation uh so who does the villain know uh, is that going to help the PCs or hurt the PCs uh, when they're trying to um, are trying to counter this NPC? Their appearance, you know, so what do they look like? That's pretty standard stuff. Their abilities and their alignment uh, could also come into play. And then we get to, we do get to a, a, um, a practice, right? So here we have the, uh, we have, Bakshra, who is a human male, fifth level fighter, and it gives him your stats. His alignment is whatever you want to make it. It's it's important to know that if you're if you're playing in a game system like Dungeons and Dragons that has an alignment system, the adversaries don't always have to be the opposite alignment of the player characters. Um, the adversary could be a neutral character that just opposes the player characters, uh, um, their objectives. And so, you know, these are things that, uh, and, and just because the character is neutral doesn't mean that they, they might not be uh, very uh, brutal towards the, uh, the PCs as well. Um, you can even have instances where, you know, the adversary is lawful good. Like, let's say a, a very, um, a very uh, zealous, overzealous uh, paladin, let's say, could be the true adversary here. And the player's not necessarily being lawful good. Uh, they could be chaotic good and, and, and have issues with this. So you don't always have to have alignment being, well, the PCs are diametrically opposed through alignment from their, uh, from their villains as well. Um, and you don't need direct alignment for patrons either, although it usually would play that case because a patron is going to expect that their uh, their followers or their uh, their wards are going to kind of conform to their world vision. Abilities increasing intensity. The last step in drawing up your character is to push him beyond everyday boundaries, allow him to become excessive, take what should be well-rounded, believable character, and unbalance him. Try to add an element that is ultimately distinguishes your villain from the rest. It's, uh, it isn't hard as you might think. And then there are, you know, some, again, there are some things that you can add to there, like twists and everything. Um, that really do make the character stand out. And then we get through reviewing the process and fleshing out your, um, your villain and go through, and these are like the steps that you would go through. And then finally, you there's a series of questions and then you have the complete villains worksheet. All right, and so here you have something that you would you would put in your binder or whatever you're using. And again, oh, I just, um, and again, this is system, di uh, you know, agnostic. You can use this across any genre and any, um, you know, any uh, game system that you're looking to do. It's, it's pretty, don't let the fact that they showed one character block make you think that this is exclusive to uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, we're still in chapter one. They're still dealing with history and, and whatnot. Let's get to the beginning of chapter two, which is here. So I will get to this in the next video. Um, and and I am like, unlike other times when I've put up these these books, I've, um, you know, I've just done an overview. Uh, this time here, I'm going, I will go through chapter by chapter. 
um, and you know hit some of those key points in each of the chapters until I feel like I've covered it. So, um, so this is not going to be an overview video. This is just an introduction uh, and, and a brief going through of chapter one for you. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, I really look forward to uh, hearing your comments on this and, uh, and responding to them. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually doing a deep dive into uh, this book as well. So it's, it's one I highly recommend you pick up because of the versatility uh, that it comes with this. And like I said, I, I literally I got this on eBay two or three weeks ago for about 30 bucks. So well, well worth it. Um, and then if you want, you can go online and find a PDF that you can flip through as I used in this video as well. So uh, as always, thanks for joining. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please remember to like and subscribe and to comment and to, uh, and to share this video out there. I look forward to seeing you on a gaming screen or at a convention sometime soon. And uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your week and uh, just keep on gaming out there and expand your horizons within this hobby. You will find that you get so much more out of the hobby when you uh, expand those horizons. Play games that you've never played before. Uh, run games if you've never run a game before. And, uh, and just keep on expanding uh, the group of people that you're playing with as well and, and the way that you're playing, the way that you're engaging in this hobby. So if you always play at home with friends online, try to get, a, uh, you know, try to get an in-person game going as well. Uh, or go to a convention and play in games and then run games at conventions uh, if that's also a possibility for you. So you'll have a great rest of your day. Take care.